to assuage the curiosity of the viewer before we go ahead and uh, actually look at uh, what inspired this and what it is, this is the image that we're talking about as we go through these videos. And uh, we'll see this again at the end. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to an attempt to <laughs> record a video that's uh, not so much a tutorial, but uh, more of a how-to of how I made my uh, uh, Blue Darkwing Warhammer uh, painting. So this is the original image that inspired it. This is the original splash screen from the uh, 1989 original Mech Warrior, Mech Warrior 1, which was actually uh, made by Dynamics uh, and Activision. And uh, as you can see, this is a, a Warhammer, uh, like a pixel art image, although this wouldn't have been pixel art back then. This was top of the line. This was a 16-bit, or sorry, not 16-bit, 16-color EGA image. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, it looks like pixel art now, but uh, it was inspired by the original Unseen design, which was originally a Macross a Destroid. Uh, but as you can see, this thing is shooting some PPCs that I guess they look like more like uh, ACs. I don't know if they had agreed uh, in 1989 exactly what PPCs were supposed to look like. Nowadays, they kind of look like lightning bolts, uh, even though they're not exactly lightning. But uh, you got these uh, SRMs shooting out here guy stepping up over a burning city and then there's this explosion in the background it's the original image I'm not sure which one was first whether it was this one or this one that came first but uh, this is the cover of the fourth succession war military atlas volume one so as you can see a much more uh, high quality version of this image it's actually instead of being the dark wing from the game it's uh, the uh, a Davion design uh, in blue. Got some. Uh, this is also a cover of Shrapnel. Same image. You can see backgrounds, names of some of the planets uh, on the map of the uh, Inner Sphere. Some aerospace fighters shooting out of here. Still, he's still shooting uh, uh, PPCs that look like uh, ACs. And then you got some Kyle Reese-looking dude down here from the Terminator. I guess is a Davion soldier wearing what? no soldier in their right mind would ever wear in the field. He's shooting some kind of super chrome sci-fi laser weapon, and he's got like a headband on, and uh, whatever he's wearing for load-bearing is fucking nonsense. <clears throat> There's a tank in the background. Yeah, this is the original uh, unseen design, with a few things that uh, the, the record sheet for this mech would never allow. Uh, also, there's some serious forced perspective here. He's stepping over terrain uh like this this is an impossible angle for this leg uh you'd need like a fisheye lens or something to get this to look like this at this angle uh also this srm would not be visible from there it would have to be pushed out which is forced perspective so you make things look dramatic and cool these missiles are like chrome srms i guess but uh it's a friggin awesome image you got this uh sort of explosion in the background that like once again, it kind of looks like it might be a tunnel of light that is you're coming out of, these aerospace fighters are coming out of, or an explosion that's bursting out. A little bit of the uh, the uh, spinning ballerina girl kind of uh, thing going on there, because you can't really, you know, sometimes you look at it as an explosion, and sometimes it's like a tunnel that you're looking back into. But the original design of this was from Macross, and this is like, a, I guess, a Bondi figurine of what they would have called either a tomahawk or a uh, an Excalibur, depending on whether you were playing the uh, role-playing game by Palladium Games or the uh, or the uh, uh, watching the cartoon show. But uh, yeah, as you can see, the weapons are somewhat different in all three of these. The, the and the the design itself is much more simplified from this this is actually a little bit more complex in terms of its design and again the perspective has been messed around with because as you can see you can't really see all of the srm from there and uh, these missile racks obviously don't exist on the battletech version and most of these weapons one of them was missing on this model but uh, obviously there's no machine guns on the head there's supposed to be like two of them down here and then some lasers uh, but anyway uh, then there's this which is a blue one a little bit more like what I, I'm trying to do. This is like, I think this is supposed to be Max, but he never drove one of these. 
pretty cool looking anyway just to give you some idea of what exactly the color scheme I was going for looks like as you can see this is very very visible from this angle but if you go to a much lower angle you really can't see this stuff so you have to force that which is what I did this here is a uh, the progression of the design in the Battletech universe so this went from being this which is the original Macross which became the unseen there were some legal difficulties which you can read about I won't go into them uh, for a while you couldn't they weren't able to illustrate the uh, the Warhammer and a number of others, the Rifleman, uh, the Marauder, a bunch of other ones too, uh, because of some legal difficulties. But eventually, this is the uh, the Mech Warrior Online version, which I think the spirit of them, they got the spirit of it pretty pretty close. It's not exactly right, and a lot of the Grunyards, the uh, sort of older 3025 guys, don't really like the newer designs. But I think that. Uh, for, for newer redesigns, uh, they're you know they're blockier. They look a little bit more modern, but I think that they did a really good job of getting the spirit of it of it down. And this is the one that I'm actually working with, which is the Anthony Scroggins Shimmering Sword uh, Catalyst uh, version that's out now that the minis are all made with. So this is the mo most recent official Canon resculpt, which uh, looks like this. This is again Anthony Scroggins. Uh, this is what would go on a record sheet uh, as an idea of what the, the Warhammer looks like now. And this, I think, you know, all things considered, they did a really good job of maintaining the, the general style of it. It's, it's recognizably a Warhammer, you know. And then this is what uh, I got building a 3D model, forcing the perspective. Uh, I'll go through the whole process, about 45 minutes. Uh, of ex uh, accelerated video at 16 times original speed because it took me 12 hours to build the model that this is from but it's got kind of a Lego looking finish uh, obviously I'm just doing this to get the, the lighting down there's a number of light sources that uh, came that this render actually came from there's one coming from over here uh, there's one coming from behind uh, this explosion is representing these are all just placeholders and then there's one over here where the PPC is going to be firing from so the uh yeah as you can see the light sources of the original you've got one over here you've got one from behind that's doing all of this scattering this refraction here a lot of this is arguably impossible but it looks very dramatic uh, and then there should be some that is coming from this but there's not quite a lot of that going on a little bit coming from the uh, from the missiles but this is what i started with before i did the overpainting so let's get to the creation of this piece of art. So what I did here is I decided to, I took the uh, Scroggins image, uh, the ortho, and I put it in the background as the background Im backdrop image. And I decided to try and build the uh, initial shape with prims. I've been working in Moto for a long time. Uh, since I used to work for Bohemia Interactive on VBS, Virtual Battle Space, uh, I found it a very intuitive way of uh, doing 3D art. And unfortunately, in this case, the, uh, the, uh, just to give me a second here, uh, that didn't work out very well. So I decided to go back to the way that I used to do it when I worked there, uh, the very uh, early days, sorry, uh, working with their software. When I used to do everything in O2, I used to build it in point mode. So I decided to give that a shot here. I, uh, it's more intuitive for me working in point, point mode because you get the option of uh, placing every individual vertex yourself. And as you can see, that's what I'm doing here. Uh, this is, once again, as I mentioned before, this is 12 hours of continuous work. And not all of it was done this way. I think actually this is pretty much the only thing that I really did 100% in point mode, just the main body. Uh, just to build the uh, the initial shape because it, it's not an organic shape so much as it is a uh, um, a very um, Like a, a complicated uniform sort of shape as you can see what I'm doing here is I'm switching between the front and the side uh, Pulling everything into into true and this again. This is a very very manual way of doing this kind of stuff the uh, 3d software nowadays has tools for all this stuff and you're about to see just pulling it all into shape. You're about to see a terrible mistake. Uh, I hadn't, when I built this model, the last one I had done was that Mad Cat, and uh, I did the entire Mad Cat pretty much with uh, with prims, and I hadn't done any uh, sort of like nuts and bolts modeling uh, in 3D in quite a long time. 
because I've been, basically I've been training in the army, haven't really had a lot of time to do this kind of stuff. So getting back to this art, kind of confused myself a little bit. So I'm cleaning up the mistakes that I made, rebuilt the object, uh, and then trying to clean up where I'm going to start pulling and extruding things in order to get the shapes of some of these uh, some of these uh, armor panels to pop out where they should go. I have a drink here. So this is a, an overcomplicated way of doing this too. There are actually better tools for this. And as you'll see later on in the project, uh, I start to streamline some of these processes. But what I'm doing is uh, building the, the, the geometry in such a way that as I, as I mentioned before, I can start extruding and pulling plates out to get some of these more complicated shapes to, to take shape. Uh, and generally, if you're gonna build 3D models, uh, you, what you need to do is you need to get used to the same way that you would uh, if you were doing 2D art as well. Uh, is you want to uh, you want to work from uh, the largest, uh, simplest shapes, uh, and then come down and and uh, get into more and more detail and just gradually refine everything, which is what I'm doing here. I've started with uh, some very simple shapes, all built in point mode, and I'm going ahead, going through everything, trying to. Uh, make all the geometry make sense. Some of this is getting cut down into, into tries, moving things around in three dimensions, flipping from side to side, looking at some of the ortho orthographic angles to try and get things to fit. And then once you've got all of these kinds of things, once you've got the basic structure that you want, uh, you can start to, uh, to double it up, mirror, start to mirror things, uh, start to extrude things, pull the shapes into the, the forms that you want. So there I'm starting to expand it out, bring it back, uh, make things a little bit more three-dimensional than what the original uh, vertices that I laid out manually were allowing. So I'm starting to pull the weapons out there. These are some points that are duplicates of the edges just to, in order to build the side of the geometry. Although you'll notice this is very simple compared to what Anthony Scroggins had in his drawing. It's actually a very, very simple uh, view of it. But that's where I'm starting. The, the 3D model doesn't have a lot of detail in a lot of parts because a lot of the overpainting is where a lot of this detail came from. So you see there I've duplicated the side and I'm just filling in the inside, the, uh, the middle portions, starting to extrude things and pull new shapes out. So there's the center plate there. I think I'm going to redo that at some point. Just uh, shaping it, moving it into true from the side, pulling all of these uh, these uh, shapes because a lot of them when you pull them out and extrude them they don't necessarily come out along the angles you want so you have to uh, you have to go in and pull them in and then gradually here trying to build this shape where the uh, the head is going to go I'm going to cut that all together and then pull the actual head out of an extrusion so you can see where that comes out just building those shapes like that I'm going to try and build uh, this ended up being a little bit of a complicated part here I'm just trying to get the windows to uh you can see I'm beveling the edges there, bringing that back so I can get the right thickness out of it. I saw a model that somebody else had built of this uh, that they made for 3D printing, where it ended up being uh, way too thin, you know, front to back. So I tried to give it a bit of the thickness that I could see in Anthony Scroggins' version. These are the uh, sort of ears, which I assume are heat sinks, but uh, just trying to build the shape of those so that they actually make sense in three dimensions. You can see the edges of that. They're pulling them into true along the edge of the surface. And then bring them back in because they're actually vents. And then that, presumably the, uh, the driver's hatch. I didn't go into a lot of detail of that because it's a very, very low angle. Uh, so you don't really get to see a lot of it in the final painting. But... Sorry, I'm having a drink here. It's the end of a long day. So they're starting to build the, uh, the windows, just going from simple shapes to more complicated ones. So you can see here that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to figure out where to put the, the bars. The windows actually have bars in them, making them match up left to right, and then trying to size them in such a way that I don't pull them completely out of true with the surfaces. So you can see I'm looking along the edges of the surfaces. A lot of this is done by the seat of the pants. And a lot of math involved from my end. I tend to do things uh, a little bit fast and loose. So yeah, pulling it into position, trying to make sure that everything matches up side to side. This can either take a lot longer or be a lot quicker, just depending on how you do it. 
also gives it kind of a rakey angle of this. It's not precisely the way that he did his. I tried to give it, make it look a little bit more like a, give it kind of a, an angry looking, uh, looking thing there. And then there's an extrusion onto the inside just to give the, uh, the, the actual cockpit uh, a little bit of shape there. And that's essentially the way that I wanted it, applying a material, like a reflective material. I like to think that the Mex glass, cockpit glass, is something like a have blue, like a gold impregnated or metal impregnated uh, for stealth purposes. And also that it's kind of a, uh, like a spinel. So it's a, so it's like a, a kind of a, an aluminum oxynitride kind of thing. So it's like a, an armor material rather than just glass. So right there, I'm just uh, trying to give, trying to, make things fit the the ortho a little bit better my cockpit was a bit small and thin so I, I bolted it up a bit and now i'm just cleaning up some of the geometry around the weapon systems pulling things into what looks a little bit more like a natural shape and there are some liberties that i've taken here uh some of the the parts just around the bottom of the center torso i changed a little bit from his design i have it coming out a little bit rather than going in uh, and then uh, in certain parts I, I just tried to do what I thought made it look a tiny little bit meaner and it's one of those things where it's like in in the Battletech universe these things were made over hundreds of years and passed down through families uh, you know this is a knight's steed basically so it's something that you know this mech maybe uh, you know may have been built before the fall of the Star League and uh, it's been passed down uh, and this is like I think the game took place during the fourth succession war so it's like uh very 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 much longer after this thing was built and they were also built in multiple factories again over hundreds of years uh my understanding too is that they continued to build warhammers until well after the clan invasion uh, and then the clans had their warhammer 2c's they brought a lot of these original intersphere mechs back with them when they came back into intersphere space so i feel like taking liberties with the designs is something you can really do like uh, obviously this you know i like to think that the originals uh like the unseen uh that those are concurrent with all of these new re-sculpts and redesigns and that there's enough room in the universe and in the ip for all of these designs to coexist and still be recognizably like your your targeting computer would recognize this as a warhammer so right here i'm building a separate object and then i'm going to go into some dirty booleans uh just to fit these things into place just uh, beveling the edges making sure making this shape actually fit and then cleaning up all the geometry when i do the bevels making sure that the thing actually looks like it's supposed to cleaning it all up pulling another bevel out and then i'm going to eventually go and draw that right back into the surface shape so that it's a single contiguous object using booleans and then of course i'll have to clean it up like a lot of these a lot of these transformations and these changes that are happening here end up making this model uh, geometry dirtier so i have to go in and clean it up afterward for example here that process right there uh, messed up the geometry so you can see me going into the nitty-gritty little bits there cleaning up all of the little bits of the vertices uh, getting rid of some of the faces and then rebuilding new ones just to, to simplify the geometry make it make a little bit more sense and i did the same thing with that front plate i went back and i I, uh, I isolated it and made it uh, a much more reasonable size. I thought it was a little bit too big. So now I'm building the uh, the uh, uh, the torso twist section. This is going to be in two parts. But this one here, I put a little bit, maybe a little bit too much geometry in it. But I'll clean it up later. Now I'm starting to pull the lasers in. Uh, giving them like curved edges, setting them to the size I want. There's a, a medium and a small in there. And uh, you'll see, I'm going to go through a bunch of different sizes. I'm not initially, obviously not satisfied with that. That's way too big. And then uh, just sort of scaling them down so that they're a consistent size, duplicating them over from side to side. Uh, still not satisfied with that. There's a few things that need to change there. They're too far apart and uh, the sizes aren't appropriate. Uh, applying materials, because uh, if I apply lighting and materials early on, it, uh, it gives me a lot more cues for the, the overpainting that I'm doing later on. So here I'm cleaning up the edges, uh, trying to build some bevels into the edges to give myself more, uh, more, um, uh, more, more uh, cues for uh, in between body panels uh, of sections, and then uh, I can assign materials to some of this stuff if I want to. But you can see what I'm building there is a bit of a bevel 
that'll create some shadowing that'll make it more obvious when I do the overpainting where some of the uh, the parts are and then uh, again here trying to trying to fix some of those issues that I saw with those weapons to make them make a little bit more sense as uh, mechanical objects because they looked uh, they looked a little like a little thin not quite uh, enough detail in them so I'm trying to complicate them a little bit same thing here just gonna pull these uh, armor panels out this is the same sort of thing that you'll see on the uh, the Scroggins design as well just giving these uh, armor panels a little bit more bulk try and make them make some sense I don't need to be perfectly accurate here like I'm not building something that's uh, intended for the military like I was when I was working on BBS building those M1s uh, you know this doesn't have to be perfectly accurate it's not CAD it's an art project so while I'm pulling all of these out and trying to give them make these into cues of armor panels I'm, they don't need to be perfect uh, and again they're they're not intended to be there because this model is not going to be used for for anything but uh, my own uh, uh, painting and I'm gonna paint over all of these details anyway so there's a lot of stuff that I can cheat on here like the heat sink uh, in the middle of the the center torso there uh, the grill I'm just gonna omit that because I can draw that I can paint that in later on uh, here I'm starting to build some of the the uh, the details of the the torso twist section uh, now there's some dirty booleans that are going to go into this later on I, I and they take so long to clean up and sometimes they don't process properly because the geometry here it's not built from prims so it's extremely complicated and moto doesn't know uh, what any of these shapes are like if you build something from primitives and don't make a lot of changes to it uh, it can usually do some the booleans very easily without requiring a lot of cleanup but as you can see what I'm doing here is I have to go and clean this whole thing up to rebuild all the all the geometry cut all of the this is what I mean by dirty booleans when you do a boolean operation on a three-dimensional object uh, it creates just depending on how complex the objects are it can create a total mess that you then have to go in and fix and as you can see here I had to do it twice uh, because I uh, there were some changes that I wanted to make to the objects before I did the boolean that uh, now I'm going back and doing so I'm going to pull all of these in I'm simplifying things the the boolean transform uh, or rather the uh, the function can't actually do these kinds of changes like it doesn't know how to it doesn't know what I want so a lot of the stuff that it simplifies uh, it does simplify but then a lot of the stuff that I needed to do I have to go in and do myself uh, you know ideally you want your geometry to be as clean as possible and for as much of it to be to be tries or quads as possible uh, it's it's better for lighting and you know they run better in game if you intend to run this in game obviously I'm not being as careful with this as I would have been if I were building an actual game model intended for a game because uh, that's not what this is this is just this is basically just glorified line art for a painting so I don't need this to be perfect but I'm still you know force of habit and uh, you know as long as it works I just want to make sure that it, I'm duplicating the two sides so I'm not having to duplicate all of my work so I just knitted that together and now I'm going to pull the tops on top on and the bottom on and now I have an object I can put on the bottom and you'll notice here what I'm doing is I'm cleaning this up because I'm going to try and do a boolean but uh, unfortunately uh, the geometry of the the torso center torso part of the mech is way too complicated and it just keeps messing up the boolean so I decided to eventually I'm going to keep trying it but uh, I eventually decided just to give up on it leave it as two separate components because again this isn't a game model it's just a painting what I would do if this were a game model and I had that problem uh, is probably just go in and manually chop all of those pieces up and then uh, join all the verts <clears throat> but you can see the booleans worked there I just did a boolean on that back portion now I'm just cleaning it up and attaching it fully onto the object so that that will be one single contiguous object that won't that won't uh, need any additional stuff see cleaning up the edges there making sure that it's all as clean and simple as possible contiguous object so there now having a look just start building the uh, the arm sections here oh no sorry cleaning up a little bit of the, uh, the weapons here uh, this I don't know I guess you'd have to ask him but uh, he, I think he was building like a rotary machine gun down here so I tried to go for something that looked similar but I also wanted it to look visually interesting uh, not that it the original part didn't uh, you can see there's a little bit of a 
a little bit of a mess there trying to build this object. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up like uh, pulling all of these things in and uh, positioning stuff so that I can build uh, uh, a continuous, once again, simple continuous objects around everything. And then uh, duplicate that. So I've got three of these. You know, this is one of the things that I feel about this stuff is uh, I also do music production and people often say that computers make everything easier. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Without a computer, I wouldn't have been able to build a computer model. But at the same time, the computer doesn't make the model for you. And, and when you're talking about building complex and unexpectedly complex geometry, the computer doesn't even know what the hell you're doing. Like, it can't do this for me. I, you know, like this doesn't simplify anything. Uh, more and more tools uh, they include on these uh, software packages. Uh, the more cluttered they get, the, the more things they'll do right there. You see, I just did a, a subtract Boolean right there. Still, I have to go and clean that all up. That's not going to just work. And you see what the bevel does is it messes up things and things still need to be cleaned. Like, uh, I, I would love to just be able to tell a computer to make a computer model for me. That would be fantastic. And obviously there's point cloud uh, and, you know, you can use LiDAR to, to, to build models of things. But they don't have this, you know, first off, they're enormously complex. And they still have to be cleaned up by artists. And, you know, maybe AI will get better at doing this stuff. But for the time being, computers don't do this. They don't build 3D models uh, poly by poly, component by component. So here, I'm building the torso. A lot of this is done orthographically. But you can see what I'm doing here is I'm trying to, trying to figure out how I want this shape to be constructed and how I want it to interface with the, uh, with the torso twist section there. Uh, trying to figure out exactly what the geometry of that is going to be and you know maybe it's, it'll take a little bit time to form there you go it's starting to look like what i wanted to do so you know a lot of this again as i say you you start with complex forms uh and then you uh you simplify uh, sorry you start with large forms <laughs> let me correct that and then you make them more complicated you do literally the opposite of that you start with big big simple objects like right there, I'm building a, a cube with uh, subdivisions in it. And then what I'm going to do to all of those subdivisions, so you're duplicating and rotating and adding things onto the sides of things, uh, flipping and mirroring stuff. And now what I'm going to do with the this, this simple box is I'm going to start pulling it gradually into shape. Just start moving things around so that they fit where I want them to. And... Uh, this was a part that I was actually looking forward to just because it's an interesting shape and you can see the way that these uh, armor panels pop out of it. There were a bunch of things I wanted to do here. This isn't exactly the way that Scroggins did it, but then, as I say, uh, I like to think of these, these giant military vehicles as being things that have been around for, you know, a hundred years. So, making all of this stuff fit, making it adding these two other little panels into uh, the bottom there, beveling these things. Taking some liberties here and there, but uh, again, that's the that's the uh, the hallmark of, of art, is just seeing what fits. So they're pretty happy with that at this point. Cleaning these things up here, I realized that uh, I wanted that to be th those panels there to be uh, to be not in the same plane but contiguous. So I'm starting to build the uh, the uh, the arm armor here, the shoulder bits, and once again, there's still there's a lot of cleanup trying to make these shapes look the way you want them to, and then uh, sort of assigning materials to get them to. Uh, to do what I want when I finally get to the uh, to the overpainting.
Sorry about that. I had to get uh, another drink. So, you might as well sit back and enjoy and uh, watch the progress. Put on some music and I will jump in when there's something that uh, I think is worth pointing out that I haven't already said. I think most of it is just, from here, is just uh, stuff you've seen already. Just refining less complicated shapes into more complicated ones. So I'm building the uh, materials as I go. Uh, that, or at least uh, assigning the materials as I go. That uh, blue powder coat material is the uh, material that I use to get the sort of uh, basic blue color of the mech. It kind of looks like, in the end, uh, at the scale that this is at, it kind of looks like Lego pieces. But uh, the metallic effect that is going to be on the final model is uh, originally uh, going to be created in the overpainting. It doesn't matter that it looks like plastic to start with because I'm going to do the excuse me, I'm going to do the uh, the metal effect later on in the painting. You can see more of this process of building more complicated forms out of simpler ones. And there's there's a few places in here where I got a little bit, uh, where I kind of lost the plot a little bit and had to go back and rebuild things. Uh, I had a I had a a bunch of uh, printouts of uh, various angles of uh, the final Catalyst uh, Mini up on the wall in my uh, studio here. Uh, just that I could refer to them and I kept on looking at different parts of this and going how do I want that to look uh, I, again I didn't want to do all of the details that are on the uh, the mini and and on the uh, uh, the model that Anthony Scroggins obviously built for this uh, evidently he built more than one uh, he had simpler ones I, I saw like an in-progress picture of that uh, uh, the one of the uh, all of the unseen mechs on the surface of uh, like a lunar surface kind of thing coming out of a, a drop ship and uh, the in progress one you could see the, the simplified models that clearly the more complicated ones were built off of or I don't know if he built different ones but there's definitely a lot of uh, variety in the overpainting that he does because uh, he's made a lot of different decisions at different times about how he wanted different parts of these to look and feel like that uh, sort of encouraged me as well to you can see where I've, I've gone back and rebuilt different parts of this over and over again here trying to decide what to make how to make this particular section look but uh, yeah I know it's encouraged me in the uh, in thinking of this as in terms of approaching it with a bit of creative freedom I guess and there, there's another part where I I looked at something that I had done and I I went back and went well I could have done that differently this this is a funny little part too because this section here excuse me is mostly going to be concealed uh it's going to be up underneath the uh the armor plating uh but anyway the point that i was trying to make was that uh sort of encouraged me in, in looking at this with a certain amount of creative freedom because i like to think of this as i as i've already said uh as uh you know these mechs are very old and they've uh been passed from hand to hand through families and you know different warriors have had them and they're like they're like if if uh, the knight's steed uh from the middle ages uh had been something that lived for a couple of hundred years they absolutely would have passed them down through families those horses were like the percherons or whatever the hell they were called the big suckers the big war horses uh, i'm sure that if those families had been able to pass those down they absolutely would have uh so you got to think of these as being, uh, you know, like uh, the future is old. You know, they, they look very high tech and everything, but they're not. These things are not uh, new. This this uh, particular mech here is a couple of hundred years old at least. 
Uh, and the succession wars, you know, in the original days, in the early 80s, when they were first designing, uh, or first coming up with, uh, uh, it was originally called Battle Droids, right, the, the IP. Uh, there wasn't supposed to have been any new construction of battle mechs for quite a long time. And obviously, as the, as the IP developed, there was. Uh, and there are, you know, different places throughout where you can see where different ones were built. But, uh, but uh, the idea, of course, is that, you know, these things have been around for a long time. And, and a lot of the technology has been lost. Uh, and they've been constantly repatched and rebuilt. And, uh, you know, rebuilt by, by mech techs of varying levels of talent. Uh, you know, and varying levels of understanding of what they were doing. So right here, I'm, I'm building the, uh, uh, the big sort of uh, energy section of the PPC here. But also trying to, you know, trying to build it in multiple parts and sort of deconflict all of the individual components. You can see I'm trying to, uh, to make them all correspond to each other. And later on when I rig this, this is all going to be articulable, so these things are going to move. And I don't want, when they're at different angles, I don't want uh, necessarily for things to be able to be seen through them. Although I did not go into quite so much detail as he did, like that elbow section in his model. Uh, it has a, like an articulated, uh, like, a, like a joint there um, with a cylindrical uh, component to it. And I, you know, in my model, you, from the painting angle, you're not going to be able to see that. So I, I didn't bother to produce it. And then I, I did actually, just for my own, <laughs> for my own leisure, I did produce a mini with my 3D printer out of this. And uh, that's, that stuff is all pretty small. You can't really tell. You don't even know that it's not there. So here I'm building the PPC barrel. There are going to be a little, a few changes that I do to this a little bit later on. But uh, yeah, here, building this heat sink on the side, which, which what I assume is a heat sink. Uh, bring the shape into true there. Pulling it into the inside. Putting the other one on the bottom. Now these are all a whole bunch of little bevels. Just uh, for some for some additional little little busyness and detail, and I'm going to complicate those later on in the overpainting. But even there, that is a lot of the stuff on the back that you're never going to see this because again, it's a painting. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you're never going to see that I'm just I'm just doing it because I'm used to building details. I didn't go anywhere near into the level of detail that uh, that I would normally have. It's a very very simple model. Now this is a part that I had already built, but uh, I was realizing that it was going to become very, very difficult to get all of the articulated components and the legs in the, the hip joint. You can see I'm beveling all of those as well, pulling all of those little extrusions out, trying to make the, uh, the ball and socket joint uh, actually look like a ball and socket joint. So I was concerned about the, uh, the, the ability to build all of these components inside of here in a way that they would actually visually make sense. So I had to go in there and uh, cut that open and pull it open and uh, make, the, make the shape work. So now these uh, upper leg portions here, I'm trying to get these into scale. Uh, yeah, you can see that this is all suddenly done uh, a couple of times. And you'll see there's a couple of times up both in the painting, and I apologize for that, and in the creation of the model where I, I uh, uh, forgot to hit record. But uh, you can see how this was built anyway. So I just basically uh, roughed it out and then uh, and then uh, went in and, and built it in a little bit more detail. And this one here, I actually thought about uh, skipping this. This is just a little bit of detail on the side that's on the Scroggins model that uh, I thought about skipping it and then painting it in later on. Uh, and in fact, it's barely even visible in the painting. But uh, at the end of the day, I felt like I was cheating just by leaving it out. So, And then, uh, you know, there's a few more things there where I was just, just trying to add some detail. Even though those are on the back, I just uh, kind of addicted to adding and you can see on this ortho you can see there are some little bits of detail there that I didn't actually include on this model that uh, I was just going to paint in later and uh, on my little mini on my little 3d printed mini again for personal use because uh, you know we all know how complicated the idea of the uh, of, of getting IP rights for producing things like that I'm not going to 
sell that or make it available to other people, but for my own sake, I, I made a little mini out of it. Uh, because I'd gone through all the trouble of making the model, I might as well. So, and I have a 3D printer, so why not? But, uh, yeah. Those little details that uh, I'm going to paint on later on, uh, on the mini, you don't even really notice they're not there. So there, as you can see, I'm, I'm building this thing in, uh, in such a way that I'll be able to uh, isolate and then pull out all the individual armor components of it. This is just the knee. I actually really like how small and articulated this component is. It actually harkens back a bit more to the uh, to the to the Macross model than the big giant knee joints in the uh, uh, the MechWarrior Online model. Not that I mind the MechWarrior Online model. I actually quite appreciate it. It looks very nimble. But it doesn't have this same sort of, uh, you know, like, uh, it, it's, it doesn't, with the big giant knee portion that it has, it doesn't really ha it have as much of a callback to the original Macross model as this one does. And there's a couple of shapes here in the, the lower part of the, the, uh, the lower legs here that, uh, that I'm trying to pull out of the, out of the ortho that I actually also really appreciate for the same reason, because it shows that he was thinking about uh, how to how to create uh, like a callback really I mean it's it's obviously you're trying to update the thing you're never going to do it exactly the way that uh, that it was done in the in the the original Japanese IP and of course why would you want to you know aside from not that there's anything wrong with them I'm a, a, a 3025 ground yard myself but uh, you know aside from making those guys happy that those designs are already out there the original designs are already exist uh, if you're going to update them, what you want to do is you want to do something like what uh, what Chrysler did when they made the uh, the new Dodge Challenger. Is uh, you try to you try to update it. You're resto modding, right? You're trying to create something that that has the thought of uh, of, of the original thing. It makes you think of it. You know, like what is what does a Dodge Challenger look like just as it's leaving your mind, right? Uh, you look at the new one often enough, and you kind of wonder what the old one really looked like. And then at the end of the day, you know, uh, which one is better, right? I mean, obviously, the, there's nothing like the year one Mopars. Those cars are fantastic. But at the same time, it's like the door panels barely fit properly. You know, it, everything was kind of... The car cost $5,000 back then. Not that that was a small amount of money, but they're not exactly... Uh, they weren't exactly built out of the best materials. So you resto mod it, you update it, you, you create it for a new audience and you try to, you know, you make it recognizably what it was and you, you call back to the original design cues in ways that are recognizable. Like the, the bulky parts at the sides of these lower legs, uh, those call back to those, uh, to those parts that stuck out at the side of the legs of the original one. I really appreciate the way that he, the way that he, uh, you know, the, the, he, he, called back to all of those design cues so here again I'm pulling out all these armor panels and I'll do this around the whole thing there are some of them that need to be pulled out more than others and other places where I just you know I kind of went to, went to town on them because they're fun to do and easy to do it's a really it's actually a very simple way of producing additional detail and I, I do lean on it I confess and I've noticed a lot of other artists lean on this technique as well uh, because you know all of those individual the like, panel lines there are all just productions of of the geometry of the object and at the same time it does make sense that that's where armor panels would uh, would be placed because obviously curved ar armor panels are much more difficult to manufacture in the real world than uh, than straight ones so wherever there's a there, there are changes in uh, in orientation, there would be either panel lines or welds. And uh, I think we're looking far enough in the future here that, uh, you know, unless you're looking very, very close, you're not necessarily going to see weld lines. So here I am building uh, building the actuator. So you can see where things appear and disappear. That's just uh, hiding. Makes it easier to work on things without other things getting in the way of them. So I want this actuator to look like... Uh, look like it could actually move and rotate and when I do rig it later uh, it's rigged around that point and I have to move that I forget exactly where I did it but 
it wasn't exactly as high as it should have been. But you can see I'm still, I'm trying to stay as close as I possibly can to the original design. Or rather to the, uh, the ortho of Anthony Scroggins' uh, model. It feels like that should be a foot. It's not. It's still part of the lower leg. And it's not articulated. Just uh, pulling all the panels out again. Adding a little bit of detail where I can. And those things pay dividends. At times later on in the work, when you're doing the overpainting, it, it can be hard, uh, depending on where the lighting is coming from, it can be hard to tell uh, where one part ends and one part begins. And so adding additional details like that can give you uh, a little bit of shadowing to work with so that you know where some of these panels are supposed to go. Finally, building the feet. And once again, this is how they go. You start with simple simple large shapes and then gradually form them into the things that you want and once again this is obviously not how fast this went this actually this model uh getting it to the point where i could start the overpainting process this model took 12 hours to build although somebody might you can see my clock in the corner. Somebody might call me on exactly the time, but the time that it took, but uh, it took quite a while. This is another thing that I like. This is the, the kind of attention that he had, right? You know, he's paying attention to all of the little things that people really liked about this design, like that foot with the two toes, and then the section in the middle there. That's. Uh, that's a cue from the original Macross model that uh, it shows a great deal of care uh, that those sorts of details are reproduced. There are a few little things that, that frankly, that I would have liked to see, but at the same time, if they had been, if those things that I'd like to have seen would have, had, had been in there, then it would have, might as well have just been the original design, so, which isn't really necessary. You can see every time I pull something out, I just try to clean it up a little bit, make it look a little bit more more uh, cohesive Just trying to give the foot a little bit of tread there and then you've got got an actuator in between I'm not entirely sure how much detail I did on those because those are hidden portions uh, they're they're uh, articulated around them they're actually darker as well uh, than the main portions of the foot so I just you know beveled them up Put a little bit of shapes in there and then let's duplicate that throw it on the other side and now last two portions of this now we build the srm6 rack so there's the mount coming in And this was actually kind of fun with a little bevel in the front. Just like a half shape there. Pull those out. Just trying to make sure that they're, uh, they're kind of uniform. And now the box itself. Here's a, another classic example of taking a, a simple shape and then making it slightly more complicated. Again, this is not necessary uh, for this model, but I'm so used to doing more and more detail that I have to stop myself. Like I would just go in and build this into a half million poly model. If you go on my, uh, my website at willrichardson.com with one L, you'll see that I have a, uh, a blue nose sailing ship there, well, a schooner. 
but uh, I went and did all the detail of all the ringing in. And that's the kind of thing. It's like a Zen state, really, when you get into all of that stuff. And so you'll notice that, in, you know, it's, I don't know if you're, if any of you are experienced 3D modelers, but you'll notice that a lot of the things that I do here, and I'm, you know, if you are, maybe you do this yourself, but uh, a lot of these things are, are done a lot more freehand than they probably need to be. Uh, just, just for the Zen sake, like in the last couple of years, uh, I've had a lot less patience generally day to day, like just been feeling it as I get older. And, uh, this is one of the ways that I, that I, uh, I get to, uh, to wind down, you know, like some people do yoga. I do this kind of thing. Like that, there's a simpler way of building all six of those, all six of those uh, uh, missile rack covers. But uh, as you can see, I go in and do each one of them individually. I could have built one of them and then duplicated it. But each one, I do them at the same time and then each one individually for any of the, uh, the changes. Potentially takes a bit longer, but uh, it's a it's a release. So there you have an empty missile rack. Shapes a bit off. It's also not the right length at the back, so I have to extend it to grab the right parts to extend it, otherwise you complicate the shape or fuck up, mess up the shape. So I'm going to build the light, right? This is the, uh, the searchlight. Now this is not quite as complicated, but then it ends up being more complicated in practice because I, I went in and built all those individual lights and I... I I didn't have to do a lot of the the little details of it, like a lot of the uh, a lot of the details of the individual lighting elements. But I decided to go ahead and do them anyway. So I built all of them. I mean, I could have just painted this in again, as I say, about all the details. Uh, I, I would normally have gone into a lot more detail about this. Like again, if this was going to be a game model, I would have done in clearly. Uh, defined all these elements and and of course I didn't even texture this model I just basically put some basic I think I had three materials on this and then uh, it's all about the overpainting but uh, normally what I would have done is I would have gone in here and I would have I would have uh, I would have textured and painted this whole thing mostly by hand but as you can see here I'm, I'm building all of the individual elements doesn't have to be done this laboriously but again this is my uh this is how i unwind <laughs> it's probably not the best way of doing that definitely the edges of all of these Once you've done all of that, you have to assign all the materials you plan to use, and then you're going to build, these are going to be mirrored behind, obviously, these are lights, and then uh, you have to build the glass elements. The lenses. Pulling the lenses into shape. Assigning materials to them. So I've been working in Moto again since I worked for BI. I find that Moto is a, a very intuitive way of working. Uh, I've worked in Max and Maya before, and uh, uh, they're so old and they've been updated continuously. Not that I have any problem with them, they're very, very powerful and very versatile, but uh, now I'm building the missiles here. These are the SRMs, the way that I see them. I had a little bit of trouble with the materials. 
uh, assigning properly. But uh, at any rate, uh, Moto, I found I've been working in O2 in point mode. Uh, I, if you don't know what O2 is, then you don't need to. Uh, but it's a proprietary BI tool. I've been working in O2 in point mode for so long. Uh, I actually used to develop in it. Uh, rather than importing models in and then rigging them in it, because it's primarily a rigging tool, like an in-house rigging tool. But uh, I had been working in O2 for so long, and I got into Moto. I, again, I had worked in Max and Maya before, and they were originally created before, basically before 3D artists' workflows really even existed. And I found that Moto's tool set was really intuitive compared to what I had become used to. So there, I've built my missiles, I've built my racks. I'm gonna have to change a few things there because those uh, those doors do not want to fit in that section. So what I did is I pulled them out further. No, actually, I, I, I forgot to save that portion. So this is what I was saying about forced perspective. So this is rigged now. So now I, I've, I've set up these uh, components so that the so that I can animate them, but you'll notice something about this. I don't have a fisheye lens on this. I'm not going to do it that way. It wouldn't look what, like what I want, but you see what's wrong there is it's not dramatic enough. It doesn't stick out. I can get it into the, roughly what... There we go. You can see, actually, that it's already happened here. Uh, allow me to just pause this for a second. Uh, so, so this has all been set now. Uh, but uh, you can see that I've actually had what I've done and I in fact I did this off screen because I forgot to save it but uh, I forgot to hit record but what I've done is I've done a rollover like a linear a linear fall off rather sorry a linear fall off up here uh, in order to change the scale of this leg in order to get it to to appear larger as it goes and in fact I think I'm going to do more of that later on but you see what I'm doing here is I'm starting to pull these objects out of position just for the sake of getting the, the drama of the image, right? Because from that angle, that doesn't that SRM6 isn't visible. See where I've pushed it? It's same thing with the light, right? Otherwise, it isn't going to fit in the image. Uh, so I can see you can see what I've done there, right there, right there, right there. See now that's what I'm talking about. That is a. Uh, I've gone back to the missile here. Just give me a second. So if you watch, you see. Let's see if I can pause it right at that moment. See that? Now there, see the way that that looks? This leg is actually smaller than this one because now this is foreshortened. And it would take, a, it would take some lens effects that would, that would compromise the rest of this in order to get that to happen. And if I did, this would be well back behind here. So when you think of the original image, right, those, those uh, visual elements like the, the SRM and the, and the, the spotlight they're not visible. They would be hidden behind those parts of this mech. So I've had to pull them out of position in order to get them to fit. And then I just took two of the missiles that I made uh, with their like little transparent section. I actually did very, very little overpainting on them because they looked so good when I was done with them that I really didn't need to do much else. Uh, and I, I'm getting distracted here. So the, this is, this uh, fall off uh, causes some foreshortening and if you just look here you can see how much bigger that leg is see how much bigger it is so that that uh, that fall off has caused that uh, that foreshortening effect that you see and also if you look up here you can see that I've actually had to put the SRM6 on the shoulder and the spotlight way up in the air in order to get them to be visible the way that they are in the original image which just goes to show you, if you're just working with line art and you're, you're drawing it yourself beforehand, uh, forced perspective becomes a little bit more of a challenging thing to do when you have to do it with, a, with you know, what amounts to a real object. So there we go. See how that was just before it came in here? It just looked super weird. Anyway, there we go. Just moving that foot around, trying to get everything uh, to look the way I want. So this is the uh, initial pre-render. So I'm setting all my lighting. Going to throw uh, another one in behind there. Just the right color. Making sure that I get my uh, my PPC light, which is like if you look here, you'll see 
that I've put all of these lights. This is the explosion from behind, this big spot here, and then this is the PPC shooting back, and then there's another light just off at the side there. So lighting the scene. There we go. And uh, I think I'm going to leave the video at that, and then I will come back tomorrow and uh, finish the overpainting. This section here that we're about to get into is uh, after the render is complete. Uh, so you can see all the lighting effects that we're just getting here. These, uh, all of this backscatter lighting. And you can see the, um, uh, the placeholder images that I pulled off the internet, like little free images and whatnot. And my uh, inner sphere background that I didn't end up using. Uh, just all getting ready to, to look at what the layers were when I started this work. So uh, when I come back, uh, I'll, I'll look through these layers just the original PDF layers of the of the of the original image, uh, and I'll complain a little bit about Photoshop, uh, and then we'll go into the actual overpainting of the painting itself. Thank you very much if you're still around uh, for paying attention, and uh, that is that.